So the no nonsense zone, and that was totally off topic. Welcome, my guests. This is Dan Heis and Leslie Tessier. We are going to be talking about everything about whole slide images. And uh, Leslie is a pathologist, and Dan is a computer scientist, and you're going to see him in a recording today, later. And I have noticed that my recordings are a little bit stiffer than the lights, but that's okay. And I let you introduce yourself. But one second, uh, let's welcome everyone who's live. Everyone who's live, give me a, an L in the chat. And everybody who's watching the replay, give me an R in the chat. Uh, I want to welcome the audience as well, because we have like over 800 people joining us for this. And now I give the stage to my guest, Leslie, maybe go first and talk about yourself like you're a pathologist so it's a pathology department with a bunch of computer scientists in this computational pathology group and you are a pathologist tell me about yourself tell our people about yourself how did you end up there so i'm a pathologist in training uh, mm -hmm. and i in france uh, and I interrupted my residency to get a PhD in computational pathology. So I was very uh, drawn to AI already in pathology. So it's a it's a choice being uh, in, in this group. And I am now uh, doing a PhD uh, in uh, well, related to computational pathology in mm -hmm. the group of Jeroen van der Lack. Um, and yes, so I'm a uh, bit between the two worlds. Uh, What's your topic for your PhD? What is your topic for the PhD? What's your, we are topic? working on automating um, a part of breast cancer grading, which is a tubule uh -huh. formation uh, grading in breast cancer, to be able to have it uh, to help help pathologists be more reproducible and also save them some time. Okay, fantastic, great, Dan. Uh, talk about yourself because in our recording, I'm like. Oh, we're gonna be we're gonna have you before and I didn't let you even introduce yourself. So go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone who's there. And I'm showing people are joining live. We have several people live already. So welcome everyone. Tell me uh, in the comments where are you joining from if you haven't already in the previous broadcast. And now Dan, tell us about yourself. Well, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Well, uh, today is also a little bit special for me because I'm back on my old university. So that's why I'm here uh, in the middle of this lab because I was <laughs> searching for a space where we could do this talk uh, undisturbed. Um, so this is the University of Twente where I studied biomedical engineering um, with a specialization in optics. Uh, mm -hmm. And from there I uh, did my internship and then my master internship at the group of Jeroen van der Laak. Uh, and I even enjoyed it so much that I also did my Just PhD kidding. there. People are always uh, bullying me like uh, I was like I'm ancient, uh, ancient stuff of the group that I was always there. Um, so I'm and with my PhD. I'm now working on uh, automating skin cancer diagnostic uh, to really kind of, uh, uh, yeah, remove these tedious tasks from the clinical workflow. So in the later video, I will tell you how I will do that. Uh, but for today, I will mainly talk then about how we make these images more from the optics side, uh, which was my uh, master specialization. Mm -hmm. Shall we start with that? Shall we? No, let's start with um, how those images with the pathology side, like what even has to happen before the image ends up on the computer screen, like on the wet lab part of things, like how do we create a slide? So there is um, indeed a, a very long route for uh, one sample to, to be visible on a, on a screen. First of all, it starts in the surgery room or with the radiologist, depending on whether you get a biopsy or a resection. Um, and so for a biopsy is very easy to figure because it's very small. Usually it is one centimeter or less. So this you would put in a block, in the tissue block, that is like three by four centimeters. And then you put your sample in it, you put paraffin, you wait um, until it's, it's um, dry, and then you start cutting very thin slices of your paraffin block, and you put them on a slide, uh, on a glass slide, mm -hmm. and uh, then you get to the staining process, and I will explain that a bit more. Then once your uh, your slide is ready, 
uh, you can then put it either under a microscope or under a scanner where you are going to get your image. And so mm -hmm. maybe to understand a bit more about this story of, well, first of all, I, I told you there is, so the biopsy, there is also the resection. And the mm -hmm. resection is a bit more complex than the biopsy because first you have to know what you're looking for. Because you have to imagine, uh, I, I guess not everyone in the audience is a pathologist, and a resection, for example, a mastectomy, is usually, well, th 30 centimeter by 20 like, centimeter. Like it's not unusual. Shape, right? Yeah, it is not unusual. And inside of it, you might have a tumor that is, let's say, six centimeters. So first mm -hmm. of all, six centimeters is not small, but still you have, first of all, to find your tumor inside of your big resection. And then you have to sample your tumor in the relevant places to make sure that you get to do the diagnosis for your patient and also that you um, that you can extract the important information. For example, is there still tumor inside of the patient? Did the surgeon remove everything? These are the things that you're going to be looking for. And therefore you sample, this is what we do in the grossing room, you sample your tumor. Um, and then from these samples, you put the tiny samples inside of the same blocks that I described for, for the biopsies. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones that you're going to stain. So, okay. and same, same process. So and grossing room is like, where, the, yeah. where the tissue from the surgery arrives and where the um, assistant who is doing the grossing, sometimes residents are doing the grossing. So basically they, they slice the, the sample that they get from the surgery room and like find this tumor that is supposed to end up on the slide, right? Yeah. What happens from there? Happens so from there? here I have to say something. I'm always so jealous uh, of radiologists. They like take a picture and they're done. <laughs> and here in digital pathology, it's like you still have to go through everything. You have to go for the analog pathology and then like add digital pathology and AI on top of that. By the time people get the glass light, they're like, they are already like, they need to do something else. <laughs> So yeah, I'm jealous of radiologists because they can just image digitally immediately. But going back, what happens after we found it in the grassing room? So we find it, we put in, in we put it in the small um, boxes that I was describing. Um, this is fixed tissue, so it has been uh, it has stayed a bit in formalin before, so that the tissue doesn't get damaged because if mm -hmm. you wait too long and you leave a tissue outside of a human body for too long, then it gets damaged. So we prevent that by fixing the tissue in formalin. Mm -hmm. You put your formalin sample, because now you have a very small part. You put it in a, in a tiny box. The tiny box you fill with paraffin. And this, once the paraffin is sol has solidified, you will be able to cut the very, very thin sections. There are three micrometers thick. So it's very, very, very thin. It's see-through. Um, so thin, so thin that it's see-through. And so this is the part that we are then going to color. And you maybe have heard about big words like hematoxylin and eosin. So this is H and E. This is the type of staining that is used in most places in the world. Some other countries at Safran, but most of the time it's just H and E. <laughs> Don mm -hmm. is smiling because yes, it's yeah, nice that, that, I, the, I really, I really, I really like cooking. So when I heard that they were using saffron, I was like, oh no, they're butchering this nice ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, in all the I thumbnails bet. for today's event, in the background, you will probably see an H and E image, a little blurred mm -hmm. because I was just using it, you know, as a background. But that's H and E. And so the reason why we use H&E is because of the properties of these colors and the way they are going to react with the chemical uh, properties of your tissue. So what it means is that you are going to have two colors, basically, and shades of two colors, shades of pinks and shades of purple blue. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you are staining and, and what type of thing you are seeing on your slide, then they take different colors. For example, the nuclei in the cell, um, they have they will react very strongly with the hematoxylin, mm -hmm. and therefore they're going to turn very purple. Whereas your stroma and the tissue, connective tissue, uh, reacts more with eosin and is going to be more pink. And so you are going to observe 
purple things in a uh, in a in a pink background. And this is very often when we show slides to um, engineers for the first time, they they tell us, yeah, but I only see pink and purple. This is the same that, when we start. That's what you're supposed to see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the an place. image. I think I can share <laughs> my image. Yeah. So th yeah. this is a platform uh, where you can get uh, this path presenter. Uh, we have green light to show those images, uh, and you also see all my notifications what I have there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but basically, that's an H and E image, and here we have nuclei. So Leslie, if you if you want me to find some images, I can. But let's let's keep talking. Yeah, perfect. So that's um, that's basically staining and what we want to see on a slide. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, and this is where we're going to enter the, the the discussion of whether you see it under a microscope or whether you see it on a digital slide. These things that the, well, the slide that Alexandra just showed you, the size of it in real life is much smaller. You need a microscope to be able to see the cells because otherwise there would be no way of, uh, of seeing them. So you need either a microscope, uh, so through the help of your lens, which you will also have lenses in a scanner. But just and that is a point I always try to make because I think people there is a big disconnect like scanner is some like a different thing and microscope is like this old school pathology and there are lenses in both of them and the same yeah. technology is, yeah. A digital, well, Dan might correct me, but I always see digital scanners as a very, very, very fancy microscope. It you're is just... You're, you're completely same... right. Even the same optics and oculars are in those uh, machines. Yeah. Really? So you're, you're basically, yeah. It's like a, a, yeah, a computer steering a microscope and that does the panning for you instead that you are turning the knobs uh, and doing it yourself. Yeah, the machine does it in a structured way. Okay, done. While we have you on the line, let's move to the um, light microscopy um, side of things. Leslie already said that we have this thing is colorful, but it's actually see-through. Let's uh, put this. Li let's describe light microscopy in simple words. This, this uh, I think, is super valuable for people who are coming from different imaging modalities, be it radiology or like different types of microscopy. Let's talk about light microscopy. Yeah, Our so optics for, expert. for that, I will then give a, a crash course 101 on, on optics um, and, and light. And so um, in order to, to see stuff, we are receiving uh, uh, light beams in our eyes and then we re-register that our brains kind of uh, color them and, and we can see stuff. So everything we see is light bouncing off something entering our eyes. Um, I think when I was very young and the first time I heard this, I couldn't wrap my head around. It was like an object is in front of me, but the object is kind of beaming itself in my eye and therefore is it there? So, um, but you, so the, the same thing we do with these optics and you have something, um, uh, what you have is like the absorption of light. So if I would absorb all the light, it won't enter my eyes, so it will turn very dark. Uh, and if you absorb all the light, then it becomes black. Um, because you don't register any light. Uh, on the other hand, if I receive all the whole spectrum of all these colors of light, then I will see it white. So that's why we also use a white light for microsco uh, microscopy. Um, because what we are doing is we kind of putting the light through the tissue. Um, there are some, and that's caused by the stain, some of the light of this whole spectrum from purple to yellow to green, some of these parts get absorbed, and that has to do to the chemical compounds that are, are, are in the staining. Mm -hmm. And out comes a, a filtered uh, light beams, uh, which go through the oculars into our eyes. And that's what we see. So the stain is causing, is acting as like a, a filter of this white light, and only a few of the colors remain. And that's what we perceive. So uh, one uh, interruption here and uh, Leslie join in. Um, so stain, the stain we're talking about now is H&E, but there are different pathology stains. So uh, those different pathology stains target different chemical properties of different things in tissue and then they like behave differently visually. So instead of like 
I don't know, collagen in H&E is going to be pink, but in some other stain like Picroseries Red, it's going to be red, right? Uh, that's how we do special stains. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, distinction you should make. I think, Leslie, you can explain that a little bit better, that we have like different ways of staining. Yes, so there are different, indeed, different stainings depending on what you're trying to see. So first, there are stainings there are things that will not appear in some stainings and will in some others. So you mm -hmm. might want to choose, depending on the type of pathology that you are looking at, you might choose a different type of staining because then you are going to be able to see the things that you're looking for. So this is, one, first of all, one of the reasons why you could choose to change um, your, your staining. For example, elastin. You might want to see the elastin in, in some tissue and you will not see that on an H and E. You need a special mm -hmm. coloring uh, for that. So where so would we? What would we? Why would we? So can you describe like a diagnostic workflow where you get the H and E and have a suspicion of something, and then you like want a special stain? Um, and obviously, you can also have uh, an immunohistochemistry. But let's talk about a diagnostic example like with this elastin like for which disease would this be and which stain would you then order and how it, would it look visually yeah so um or you can pick a different example, example you whatever could, is the easiest the, no i think the easiest one and the one for, for residents the, the one that we get in med school everywhere is congo red so it's very very mm -hmm. very very specific but it's specific of one disease which is called amylosis and mm -hmm. you want to use the congo red to see the amyloid deposit. So you want to see um, a, a very specific type of deposit that happens in the disease. And for this, you need the specific staining that is called Congo Red. And there is even a step after it where you use polarization. And uh, it's green and not red, right? Hmm? Then it's green and not red. <laughs> exactly. You might want to use then the, 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 the polarization uh, of, of your microscope. Uh, and this is something that I think the reason also why I'm using Congo right now is because we can also discuss the limitations of digital scanning because polarization is not possible yeah, on a, in a scanner. So, mm -hmm. so this is also uh, an interesting part. So basically what happens in the, in, in, for, for Congo red, the, dip, the deposits, we can first of all see them in Congo red and we couldn't see them properly on H&E. And then to make sure they have to be what we call birefringent in um, in in the uh, under polarization. So we're going to change the way the light enters the, the the tissue, and we're going to see if there if it changes color, basically. Mm -hmm. And so this um, this is a process that um, you can not do under polarization only. Yeah? You you could you could totally digitalize Congo red. But mm -hmm. then you could not go through that step of this dynamic step of checking if there is a change in uh, in color. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so amylosis is one of these diseases where you might want to use a very specific stain to highlight something that you couldn't see uh, on H&E. Uh, but mm -hmm. then also the reason, so these specific stainings and the reason why I talked about H&E first is that for morphology, H and E is the standard. This is the one where usually morphology is seen the best. And then you might want to add specific stainings to add some more information. But you very usually always have, or almost always have your H and E, which is going to be your base. And then mm -hmm. from there on, you're going to start thinking of the disease that you might be seeing. What does my patient have? Why is my patient coming, etc.? What is the organ that I'm looking at? And then from there on, you build your clinical reasoning on top of that. And this is your clinical reasoning that is going to decide what type of specific staining you want. And also maybe immunostochemistry, which is a different mm -hmm. type of... Well, Really I have a super cool comment. I don't know. Do you see the comments? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Are see. there any colorblind pathologists or does it make you completely unfit for the job? I had a, had a colleague who was a colorblind pathologist and he was board certified pathologist. So Leslie, do you have colleagues that are colorblind pathologists? And by the way, so yeah, um, there's a um, 
yesterday I recorded with Lander. Lander is going to join us at some later point. And he's colorblind. And I was totally caught off guard because he was describing uh, points like, where are they in space? And I'm like, say it's a red one. <laughs> and he's like, I'm colorblind. I reacted in a funny way. So whoever is going to watch that recording is going to see me being a little surprised. Anyway, but Leslie, colorblind so, colleagues, do you have colorblind colleagues? I don't have colorblind colleagues. I also think probably depends on the extent of the colorblindness. But um, more than anything, um, when, so yes, of course, color does matter because it helps you. It's a cue and it's, it's immediate. You, you know what you're looking at. But a lot of experienced pathologists, and when, when I was, during my training, I heard multiple times, it's not the color, it's the morphology. It is <laughs> how it looks. And when you go from one center to another, for example, from one lab to another lab, people have different, uh, different preferences, even inside of H&E, uh, when it comes to the amount of pink and the amount of purple. And so I, I've seen myself looking at slides from different centers and thinking, oh, wow, that's neon pink. Or, or, uh -huh. or the opposite, where you are almost disturbed because where is the pink? It is, it is so purple, and it takes you a tiny amount of time to be like, okay, let, okay, now that's the that's the basis. Let's look at the slide. Let's look at the morphology. And mm -hmm. I think if a pathologist does this, that does this on their daily life, like you see slides from a different center, they are a slightly different color, then it shows that color doesn't matter so much. But what really matters is the architecture, how the fibers, um, for example, muscular fibers, they have a very specific way of, um, of uh, being put next to one another. Or So this is the morphology and it, it, it goes beyond, exactly uh, beyond color. Part. Color is a help. It helps. Comment. But I, I don't think it's a necessity. We have one no, comment yeah. that, um, let me address a comment from Sandrina. She says that there are small volume scanner that can scan and polarize light, which is fantastic. Great to hear that. And everyone, if you have comments, questions, drop them below, even if you're watching the replay, because uh, first of all, I know what you want to know. And uh, even if we don't cover it uh, in this particular broadcast or in the broadcast today, I have the data to give you what you want. And second of all, if you find it useful every time you like, comment or you know subscribe this is getting shown to more people so uh totally you can totally help spreading the word and going back to your leslie connor uh, comment that color doesn't matter so much uh yes so yes and no later we're gonna have uh, for ai uh, that like ai is not a human and uh, we have to mitigate strategies for for the color with ai but I very much want to uh, add a little um, note on top of that. One time I was being audited by a regulator uh, in, a comp in a digital pathology company I was working on. And he said, oh, you have this screen here and this screen here. And like, how do you reconcile that the H&E uh, looks slightly different? Like, um, And I don't know if I prepared for this in advance, but I basically looked at this image and I'm like, all the information that I have is within this image. Like the uh, background that I see compared to the rest of the uh, immunohistochemistry, because then often you grade intensities. Even if it looks the same slide looks different on a different screen, uh, and there is obviously like an ongoing discussion: Do you need medical screens for patho for digital pathology? Do you need to calibrate? Blah blah blah. Anyway, but you get this image displayed, and all your references are within this image. You as a trained pathologist or a trained uh, tissue expert, you know where is your background. You know that uh, the, the um, level of blue for the nuclei should be this compared to something else. You have like internal healthy tissue within the slide that is your internal control and you compare it to that. So it's morphology, like you say, and the references within the slide uh, are very informative for evaluating a slide, even if labs have different um, preferences, like, you know, you, reagents after a month are not the same after the first day, and you're still, you know, at some point you have to replace them, but uh, maybe not immediately. So this type of stuff is important to talk about. Okay. So we covered the special stains. We said that scanner is 
actually a microscope. And when we have time at the end of the broadcast, I want to uh, talk about how a scanner is built. I don't know if we plan for that, but uh, I think uh, we can talk about it. And the next thing is, how do you translate this image um, that is being scanned in the scanner to RGB pixels? And what does that mean for like further analysis? And also, that's a question to you, Dan. Also, um, like, let's address the size and the way those images are created. Because I think this is something we kind of grew accustomed to. It's already obvious uh, for us that there are tiles, lines, whatever. It's not the way other medical images are generated. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this transfer from glass analog to digital. What happens there? Yeah. So I think here first you need to kind of understand how uh, what pixels are and how they are yes. generated. So to give you the best uh, analogy is like uh, maybe you still know. I hope that there are a lot of pathologists here who had this uh, during uh, that you, in your eye you have like these cones which are sensitive for light. Uh, and that's the reason why we can see uh, um, point A and point B because we have multiple cones and we can kind of see which one responds the highest to the, to the input. And this is how we can um, discriminate between points. Uh, like, like light beams entering, like this is beam A, this is beam uh, B. Um, the same thing we can do with, with, with a, uh, with optics and, and in a digital way is that we have like very little photosensitive sensors. And if a, a light beam structs on there, uh, we can see how much uh, red in this red spectrum of light was in there, how much blue and how much green. Um, so we as humans do process we do like that, that as this, well? We have multiple cones which are mm -hmm. sensitive for red, green and, and blue. I don't know if it's blue, I think it's yellow. Um, um, so three of these uh, and, and the mixed combination of that, our brain processes it into, into a color. I didn't know that. No. I didn't know that we're doing like the <laughs> color mixing in our brain. Yeah, we are. That we are. We, that's why you. people have color blindness because one of these cones is, is affected. So the, the, the signal is, is... Here an aha <laughs> moment for Alexandra. <laughs> So the same thing we have in a, in, a, in a chip, and we call that a CCD chip. So those are very sensitive. And that's the moment we have pixels because every very little chip there receives the light and kind of can measure how much of red and green and blue is in, in this light spectrum. Um, and that's the point where we're going to talk about megapixels because we have an array of all these photosensitive cubes next to each other. And that's what we are kind of know from pictures that you see these cubes. So every cube mm -hmm. is a measurement of the, the, the light, the amount of light in this different um, green, blue and yellow, um, green, blue and green and red. So um, the more you can imagine, the more of these very tiny cubes you can put next to each other, the more spatial difference you can catch. So um, that's what we say. Ten uh, megapixels is an array that, if you would count them all, results in 10 million of these very tiny um, sensitive pixels. If we say 100 megapixels, for example, then you have way more and you're very good at discriminating points. So that's how we can kind of catch light and translate it in a, in a, in a digital signal. And what we do with a microscope is that uh, the light goes through the tissue and like a beamer, it kind of starts going out. So we're kind of projecting the image uh, on this CCD chip. And you can imagine the, the farther we do, the larger this image gets. So if you very, mm -hmm. if you have a very big array of all these tiny uh, photosensitive cells, the more you have and the bigger the image, the more you can capture at a very high resolution. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you look through a microscope, we only see a small part because we're not able to illuminate the tissue and catch everything. So that's why we're kind of panning because yeah, well, the light is kind of fleeing our optics. So we have to catch like a very tiny part. At the time. Mm -hmm. At the time. And what the scanner does, because we want to have the pictures capable exactly at the size that is capable of fitting onto this CCD chip. 
Um, so it's a picture at very high resolution. And then we move a little bit step further and we make another picture and we make another picture. And this we all stitch together. Mm -hmm. And here the, the, the so problem like we then have comes. This and we do like a little one, little one, little yeah. one, little one. Yeah. And then well, um, people maybe know from a panoramic photo. Sometimes in life you want to make a picture True. of the whole skyline, uh, yeah, but your optics are only capture this. Yeah. So then you're kind of making a sweep and you can capture everything. And what you get is a very Sweet. large image. I'm going to be stealing all those analogies that you have. Um, <laughs> they're just so good. Um, and I, I'm going to interrupt for a second because I was uh, showing some comments. Guys, you totally have conversations down there. I just showed the. Um, there was a question that uh, Sandrina told us that there is a scanner. There's a question, what scanner is that? And Sandrina told us that the Zeiss Axis Scan 7 totally drops stuff there. I am happy to show the tools, whatever that is. It doesn't matter uh, if you have uh, are having related conversation. I'm going to be showing this stuff. Okay. And then there are more people thinking it was a great analogy. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And also about the polarization, it's just like a little step in between the optics row. So I could imagine uh, that every scanner should be capable of, of doing this. Um, but I don't know if the vendors then support it. But yeah, like technically, every scanner should be able to do it if you put the Polaroid filter in there or mm -hmm. polarizing filter in there. Um, so one time. I have, I know it's on a tangent and I'm going to stop interrupting you. But one time I had polarized glasses on and yeah. I had the, my camera, I was holding it like that. And then when I moved it, that like that, I didn't my see the image. My screen is broken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like getting so angry. I need a new camera. And uh, a friend of mine, he's a um, computer scientist as well. He's like, Maybe it's about the polarization and the direction of the um, of the light beams that are being led through this is just your horizontal one, not the vertical. But yeah, I yeah, don't know if it yeah. L LEDs uh, emit the light just in one uh, one phase of this uh, of the polar. But then we get into polarization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's stop. Avoid. But I just should thought avoid it was that. Funny. Um, but to get back to these images, so uh, we have this panorama picture and we need to stitch this whole image together but you can imagine if i have like so much like a digital picture is already big if i make now a picture with with my iphone for example and i will print it out on canvas then i already have like this on actual actual pixel size then it's already very huge and now we are making like so much pictures one after each other because we want to cover the whole uh slide so you have a lot of pixels and then we go from megapixel, we are talking about gigapixel, like it's a billion pixels. So then we are talking about whole slide images, which are gigapixel images. Um, and it's very hard to, um, because you need to compress all this information, uh, because uh, and because uh, the, the nice thing about compressing is that if there's a l large white space, you could just say like, okay, this whole area is white. That's the... Mm -hmm very quickly what you are doing with compressing. Um, uh, but that doesn't solve it. And then we get to a another thing before we can actually use this image. And that's that we are kind of building a, a pyramid of multiple resolutions. Because mm -hmm. you are yes. the same as Google Maps. To make it very snappy and interactive, you are not scrolling through gigapixels of pixels. You are scrolling to a summary which resembles the pixels. And if you want to go into the satellite image, for example, then it loads a higher resolution image to give you more context and more information that is uh, stored there. Mm -hmm. So based on the summary, on the like low magnification, or uh, you decide where you want to go in deeper. Yeah. And how many pixels you want to load from your library, uh, mm -hmm. from the original library that has all the pixels, um, you just want to load them very specifically. Otherwise, it's very hard to uh, get them all. We have a good question here that uh, whenever there is tiles, uh, there is this question. When you pan the microscope, do you get overlaps in the boundaries of the images of, this, of the tiles? I, I assume um, so for uh, Kira, the, for the, Kira <laughs> means with scanning. Yeah, yes, with sometimes, the scan. sometimes you see the scanning artifacts, but they do a lot of uh, post-processing now to remove that stuff. Um, the biggest problem is, is that you are illuminate, illuminating the tissue 
at the point. Mm -hmm. And if you move it slightly, then this illumination can change a little bit. And what you then see in the digital image, like this checker pattern of different ah, light okay. intensities. Um, so they have to correct for this, uh, but you can also make, I, I don't know what, what the technique is behind all these scanners, but you can of course also make a half image and then kind of average the part, which mm -hmm. is overlapping. And then this way you're kind of averaging out the, the signal. So there are a lot of techniques to, to um, um, fight these problems, but this is actually a real, a real problem so, yes. to, to stitch it well. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that was a very important question. So um, when, and so this is how it gets translated into pixels. We have the uh, multiple, so first of all, like the mega extra big panorama where when we interact with these pictures, it's a little bit different way than just looking at the, at like picture that you can look at everything at the same time, like a picture of a, ga a cat, a picture of a dog. Um, any other differences that we want to highlight between the natural images? So natural images, this is what you guys, computer scientists, um, um, use for the normal pictures from the phone, right? With uh, whatever object we're uh, imaging. And then pathology images. Anything else that we want to say that's different there? Do you well, remember, the, Dan, how big the... Um, can you translate? I, and if you can't, I will ask her later. How big is the image net library compared, like in how uh, many pathology images would you include the image net? Wow, I think, I think uh, like image net, I don't know. I think there are 32 by 32 pixels, maybe scaled down and maybe they are already a little bit bigger. Uh -huh. um, but a whole slide image uh, can go up to 300,000 by 200,000 pixels. So I think you could almost fit the entire slide with the whole image net data set. Uh, as a surface, so yeah, yeah. So that's there's a lot the... of information in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are the differences with um, how we interact with a glass slide and with a digital slide on the um, com on a computer screen? Um, first, maybe Leslie, from from the pathology perspective, when you started doing digital pathology, what were the things that like from the user interface and also from the evaluation standpoint, where did you have to switch? And uh, what did cost you energy and what like was more intuitive than in the microscope? Any comments on that? Yes, well, uh, first of all, maybe uh, I need to say because now we are in an era where some residents are starting with digital slides. This was not the case for me. I started my training, I'm not done with the training, but I started my training with a microscope. Mm -hmm. um, and so I arrived here, here and was, pardon? Same here. <laughs> and, and I was uh, shown proper digital slides. Of course, there are digital slides, even if your workflow isn't digitalized. Sometimes you are shown slides, etc. But really interacting and spending a lot of time on a YSI, this is something that I discovered when I arrived here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first, uh, so it's very intuitive. I never wondered um, how to use the pointer, for example, scrolling is a natural movement to zoom in. So mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. these things are very natural if, if you're used to using computers. Yeah, the, 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 the process feels natural. However, I think for me, the biggest difference was the focus that you have because when you're on the microscope you have your eyes in the oculars and mm -hmm. your world becomes whatever is under your eyes so your your field of vision is entirely this tiny um this this tiny field microscopic field that you're looking at there is nothing around it mm -hmm. and when you're looking at a screen then behind i mean there's there's a screen but there is also There's a, a team pop-up or some behind chat it, there pop up. Are, Yeah, behind it there are plenty of things. Like Dan is sitting in front of me. I see Dan when I look at the slide. 
Uh-huh. So this is great. Great course, to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you're also very tall. So no, but um, what I'm trying to say is that your focus is a bit different. You, it, it takes for me. It took a tiny bit of time to be like, okay, I am doing the same job that I used to do on a microscope, but now with m- many more informations, m- many more information around me, and I have to learn how to go back to the slide and, and focus entirely on, on what I'm looking at. Uh, this was the first thing. Um, and I, I, I think the second one is that still on a microscope, um, even if you go to the, um, to, uh, the lowest power, it is not always the case that you can see your entire slide. Mm-hmm. So the overview is already narrowed. And you can't see, so usually if the, the slide is very big, uh, I mean, if, if the, the, so the slides are the same slide, unless you are using a macro slide, but normal slides. But even then, uh, if your section is really big, then even if you go to the lowest power, you're not going to see it I'm gonna share, fully. So yeah, gonna and this is a very, this is a view that you could only have with a digital this scanner because it, it goes so, uh, so far away. And I think it's a very good thing because then you get an overview of your tissue and you really know where you want to go. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is so much information at first when you're not used to it, it takes a bit of time to relearn how to assess your slide in a systematic manner. Because there is something procedural. Great comment. And I'm going to just... um, yeah. go ahead and then i'm gonna show like what would be let, let me show so that would be the lowest that you see under the microscope this is yeah. 2x here and when we where is my 0x and here is the 0x uh and and 2x is you know so you definitely need to like focus let's say you know that this is your area of interest you have to like go there to the center of this and and yeah so let's tell me about the procedural things so yeah it's the slides when um so when i started learning how to use a microscope i was told um to make sure that you assess your slide entirely you should go so your your very first steps are um almost the same every time there is a there was something in my hands that i was i knew my microscope and mm-hmm. I, I knew, like, I go like twice this way, then then unscrew twice, then just just left, then right, then etc. So your the, the the path that I was following to read my slide was almost the same to get an overview. Then of course you start zooming in, and it's different. But getting an overview of the slide was something that was very procedural. I wasn't even thinking of that; it was in my fingers. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, when when you get a mouse pointer then it 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 is in your fingers again but in a very very different way and um since you see the whole slide you are tempted to zoom in immediately there's so it it is hard to go back or at least for me at first it was hard to go back and, and think okay zoom out and then, then go to this other place because your eyes are drawn to the tumor for example if the mm-hmm. tumor is very big then of course you want to see it but but there are other side other things on the side of a tumor that you might be interested in dcis for example in, in the case of breast pathology you might want to see if there is this if there is a non-invasive carcinoma very very close to the border this is an important thing but then since you get so much information from this overview which is a very good thing it takes to me it took a while to be able to um fight myself and be like mm-hmm. okay just we see we do it systematically again we we, we start we, we see everything and then we go to the tumor and we do our thing so i think everyone works a bit differently for me this was my process but what i'm trying to say is that when you have a habit with a microscope then it might you might have to fight your habit a bit when you go uh, and, and use a digital slide yeah Nothing... you need to develop new habits exactly. to be like uh, to make sure for yourself because there's no like oversight you, you give a slide to a pathologist and they're supposed to give you the diagnosis or the information nobody's like monitoring how you do this as long as the outcome is okay so for you 
like you say exactly, you need to develop a new process and be sure that you're actually providing the same type of uh, information that you were before. I'm gonna interrupt for a couple of um, couple of comments. So this uh, this comment that I'm showing now, did you notice any difference of using 1080p versus 4K monitors in reviewing pathology images? Any comments on that? So I just wanna uh, frame it. What is the uh, border where it even makes a difference for a human eye? Do we like see the difference? Yeah. So you have also 5K monitors. Like me also, personally, I just see the difference. So with 4, 4K, we again say the the amount of, of pixels uh, which are on. The, I think it's on the bottom axis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So we have four four thousand pixels like this way, and then into the height. So the if you have a 4K screen which is uh, this big then you still need to divide these pixels there. So again, the spacing gets bigger. If you have a very tiny screen, so, such as my laptop, which is like this, mm -hmm. uh, then these pixels are way smaller. So you always need to think about 4K only says something about the amount of pixels, um, but the size of the screen depends then how good you can distinct, distinct between these pixels. And of mm -hmm. course, the smaller they are, the better they are uh, in, in, in discriminating between A and B, like that you can see a dot on the left pixel or the right pixel. Mm -hmm. However, our eye is limited uh, due, due to the lens in our eye. So as a kind of rule of thumb, if you have a 24 inch monitor, which is kind of common to have, now we have 27. If you are 80, 80 centimeters, like almost what I'm seeing now, away from your desk, your eye is not capable anymore of of making a distinction between these pixels on a 4k monitor mm -hmm. so everything further than then that you then you can't see the difference anymore um but if you like to be very close at your screen then i could imagine that you then see the pixels which can be maybe uh tiring for your eye uh or maybe um uh you don't see it very well so it's a it's an edge case and i think with the 4k screens we kind of solved this problem uh mm -hmm. leslie can you comment on that before we go to the yes, next uh, yes. comment i will answer that one but go ahead um, leslie do you have do you have experience with different resolution of monitors so me personally uh, like i don't see it but i also am very bad because if you give me bad coffee and good coffee i don't distinguish the taste so maybe it's just me <laughs> 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 no, well, um, if I am uh, um, very honest, I, I again I started reading slides, digital slides with the material that I was given here, um, and then I have a monitor, a monitor at home um, to to work from home too. But both are 4K, mm -hmm. uh, and the one that I chose at home, are you spoiled? It's, it, it, I, I just chose one monitor. for. Yeah, I just chose one for um, uh, photograph. So people who do uh, who edit uh, photography, mm -hmm. so that the color rendering was nice. Because to me, it was probably more important than. But honestly, so I, I've only worked on 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 four K monitors, but I have seen um, different hospitals where probably the, the monitors were not four K, and it doesn't prevent you from doing your job. No. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, is it more comfortable than I, I wouldn't know because I haven't experienced them at the same, I mean, I mean, I, I work on a 4K monitor, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't mean that, uh, that, that I it's work not on a 2K and that was like the vendor recommended for the viewing software that I'm using in my job and it's good. Uh, but I'm the worst because when I look on the laptop, it's good as well for me. So and I think also other stuff is way more important, like the refresh rate, so the frames per second, uh, which your eye perceive, Let's like the higher, the more more natural. But before we go into that, because I want to focus on that as well, uh, because that was something omitted in digital pathology before, and everybody was like, "Why is it so slow? The internet transfer is good. The image is like loaded and everything, but it's still slow." And that was the refresh rate. But just want to address George's comment: How big was the slide that I was showing? Uh, so the the um, slide here. Uh, on a, a glass slide, so the glass slide is one inch times three inches, which in the SI system is, I don't know how much, three, uh, that's going to be 75 millimeters. 
one inch is 2.5 centimeters and seven something like that so so the uh, the You're size of the there, sorry do you know yeah do you yeah, know how big this slide is yeah, normal blocks. So, which then then your slide. Uh, I mean, the the block limits the size mm -hmm. the size of the tissue that you can put on your slide, right? Because this is what you're cutting. Yeah. They are three by four, for okay. centimeters. In centimeters. Centimeters. Yeah, okay. Centimeters. Yeah. So. Um, sense. but then there are what we call macro blocks. That's a different thing. But then the the, the normal size blocks they are three by four. Yeah, and then we have a, a question about digital staining. We can address this at the end, uh, but. I want to talk about the refresh rate. Let's talk about the refresh rate in the monitors. Yeah, that's something. Um, um, what is it? Let's start with what is the refresh rate? So uh, we move stuff at our screen and the refresh rate says something. I'm how something here, refreshment. That's yeah. Refresh rate. So how good is your uh, system capable of delivering a new image? Because if I, if I slide, the computer needs to render these new images. And uh, if you say that you have a refresh rate of 60, that means that you can make 60 images within a second. And we say that frames <laughs> frames per second. Um, and you can imagine if it's very low, there is a, a point that your that your brain start to notice that we are loading a frame from frame for frame. And this is this stuttery ID. I'm gonna try to challenge here. It's not, yeah, like it's well, not even in, slow. In, I in, thought in it would a, be slow. In a live stream, it's uh, it's I think a very low frames per second uh, because streams are normally like thirty frames per second. Um, so you you can imagine and the effects you get with a very low frame rate is like this this sweep. You have some uh, sometimes you call it ghosting or shadowing. You see like a mm -hmm. sweep of the old image still there. Uh, and that's what the pathologists are getting so annoyed about because you're uh, used to what you're doing under the microscope. It's the speed of your fingers. Yeah, yeah. And the, well, it's the speed they, of light, actually. See, we're as fast as light. The pathologists are <laughs> as fast as light. But and like to be faster, uh, we take off the stage of the microscope because and then instead of using the micrometer, uh, sorry, not the micrometer, the stage screw, you just like drive it with your fingers because you can be faster. And if you have a slower screen, then everybody's like, oh, I don't want digital pathology. I'm faster than yeah. digital pathology. Because the computer needs to catch up uh, where you are heading because he needs to create these new screens. So um, the, uh, there's a part of the computer that loads the image and, and makes it an image. And there is the part of the screen which is capable of kind of resetting your pixels, uh, which are in the screen, to create another image. And those have to work in sync. So your laptop usually uh, is now good at 60 frames per second, for example, on a 4K image. Mm -hmm. um, but your screen can have maybe a, a refresh rate of 30. So then the screen is limiting how fast it can uh, make a new screen. So it's always good to check if you have both. Um, and At you the have same some level. Yeah. And you have some, I don't know, vision gurus who say like, no, I want 120 frames per second because I experience it better. It's the same with like these gold plated uh, audio jacks. Some people say that it improves audio quality. The same is with these kind of settings. And but, I probably yeah. wouldn't be able to notice. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is it, it is important that we uh, that it goes very smooth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I would even add because maybe there are now in the audience people who develop these microscopes and these digital. Um, well, yeah, there are. Resume. So if you guys have a yes. request for vendors and for people who are doing this, go ahead. And you can communicate with them here as well. Yeah, because I want to say what Dan is saying is very, very important. The fact that it's smooth, but because um, there is something proprioceptive. That again, it's in your fingers and the movement that you do with your pointer if distance, the distance that you're traveling with your pointer is not the same as the speed on your screen, then it makes it hard when you're zoomed in to go back to a lesion that you've seen mm -hmm. um, because then you're lost in your image and you don't really know how far you are from what you've seen. Whereas when you were under your microscope, you know, it's a quarter of a turn. I was a quarter mm -hmm. of a turn away. And so this, this, if your image freezes and doesn't follow the movement that you do with your pointer, then it can make it harder. So when it is something very obvious, of course, you're going to find it uh, from, from your overview again. 
But when it was a very tiny detail, or you wanted to show something to to your supervisor when you when you're a resident, or 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 just to a colleague, um, then it, it is very important that you can go back to it relatively quickly because if again with this scanning thing you can you can you can see a slide at times 40 an entire slide at times 40 so very very high um, power and and then if you're very far from it it can take a while until you go back to it so you have to know proprioceptively where it was and I think indeed uh, the the challenge one of the challenges of the digital slides is to reproduce this very proprioceptive experience that, that there are not only your eyes, but you're mm -hmm. you're looking at the slide with your hands. You're looking at the slide with way more than I than think we need to have a follow-up discussion on this, like a separate, and we're going to have, a, Leslie is going to stay up till, I don't know, I make you stay up till 10 o'clock today <laughs> to have a discussion at the end about basically like, uh, but we're going to be talking more about AI tools, but I think we should have a follow-up discussion on yeah. this transition from glass to digital. We obviously both are involved in the digital pathology world, so like we want to make it work. But there's plenty of people that, like you say, want to have the same proprioceptive experience because this is how they work best. This is how they work most efficiently. They don't want to change. And because, you know, change takes time, they have to be fast. So if you, if somebody from the pathology side, and by the way, let me know if you're on the computer science side of things, put a CS in the chat or pathology slash life science, put uh, this in the chat. And if you would like to uh, have Leslie, join me again for another live uh, separate from this event to talk about those differences and um, drop a follow up in the comments uh, because I think it's an interesting discussion and I'm super happy to, to hear your perspective. Um, and we are three minutes before I have to join another broadcast. Um, we had a comment about digital staining and we have a comment about if we see a need for standardization. Uh, of glass slide digitization process to make digital data interoperable and comparable. Yes, I see this. <laughs> I see yeah. this need. Uh, that's kind of beyond the scope of our talk, uh, but very much, and we didn't even talk about formats and all this stuff, you know, there is a lot more that we're going to cover and we're already taking. But they, they are they are busy, uh, busy doing this, making a standard uh, way. Um, I even saw a fun one in the middle where they actually printed a glass slide where the scanner can go over it so it exactly knows which color is there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it can calibrate so we all reproduce the same color to the same um, colors physically. Um, and you can also measure this and we can store that into the DICOM format to see what kind of color scheme you are using so we can know like how to format switch. by the way i recently yeah. talked to uh, david Coluni, who's the dicom standard editor uh, so there is a broadcast about that you can find it on my feed or on youtube and um, i'm gonna like i want to cover a couple of comments before i have to jump on the other um but so here how important would you rank the optimization of the court focus setting compared to the other challenges in the workflow i'm going to take this one so if i have a good slide there should not be focus uh, issues if this is a thin slide leslie smiling <laughs> so basically i don't see it as a problem i know it's a problem in cytology in um cytopathology because they have z stacking i wouldn't prioritize because i see good slides Leslie, do you have an opinion of that? On that, you're on. No, I, I agree with the fact that um, so it, it's the the Z stacking. So the the focus point is mm -hmm. a very uh, important thing. I, I I think it depends on the task that you have, because the Z stacking has nothing to do with architecture. Like architecture, you don't need Z stacking to see your architecture, um, etc. But for some smaller tasks, it, well. First of all, for cytopathology, then yes, of course, you, you need that. But also for, for example, for mitosis counting, I know that uh, in the hospital where I'm working, uh, some pathologists still prefer to count mitosis under a microscope. Because sometimes if the focus is not perfect, then there is like some figures can be either apoptotic or or they can be, uh, maybe it's a lymphocyte that has a weird shape, mm -hmm. or yeah, you're not exactly sure. And if you have the Z-stack, then you can go see if there are little hairs. 
Um, and uh, this, so the DStack, the ZStack can be a thing, but indeed, when it comes to AI uh, and and the, the the most of the workflow, um, I I don't think it's uh, it's necessary as long as there is no blurry area. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. then it is, I'm gonna, it is I need to kick us out <laughs> unfortunately I'm going to end this broadcast because I'm going to jump into the next one with Leander thank you so much thank you everyone who dropped comments you are amazing yeah, thank you very much. And keep listening to us I'm going to be with you in one second bye 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 and even for replay keep dropping comments <laughs>